In a historic first, Medicare for All actually got a hearing on the Hill. During that hearing, Addie Barkin, in advanced stages of ALS disease, spoke. Here's a segment of that. But never before have I given a speech without my natural voice. Never before have I had to rely on a synthetic voice to lay out my arguments, convey my most passionately held beliefs, tell the details of my personal story. Medicare for all is the only way to make our health care system more efficient. Over the past three years, I have seen firsthand how the current system creates absurdly wasteful cost shifting, delays, billing disputes, rationing, and worry. Administrative waste is costing us hundreds of billions of dollars every year. Some people argue that although Medicare for all is a great idea, we need to move slowly to get there. But I needed Medicare for all yesterday. Millions of people need it today. The time to pass this law is now. Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. That was the, a hearing of the Rules Committee. As I said in the beginning, it was the first time Medicare for All actually got a hearing in front of a committee in Congress. And now joining us to continue our discussions about health care and more about the American political system is Wendell Potter. Thanks for joining us, Wendell. My pleasure. Uh, Wendell is a former health insurance executive. He served as head of corporate communications for Cigna before leaving in 2008 with what he described is a crisis of conscience. He's the author of the book Deadly Spin. An insurance company insider speaks out on how corporate PR is killing healthcare and deceiving Americans. He's also the founder of Tarbell.org that does investigative journalism into healthcare issues and money and politics. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So uh, you watched that hearing this morning. Uh, first of all, talk about the significance of, of the hearing. Well, it just is significant in that uh, just 10 years ago, uh, advocates for moving to a Medicare for all type of health care system were not given a seat at the table at all. In fact, uh, there were advocates who were literally thrown out of the Senate hearing uh, when uh, there was uh, they were protesting the fact that no one was there on the at the committee level to, uh, to even testify about Medicare. So just to place people, this is the hearings under the, uh, President Obama's administration. Right. He gets Senator Baucus to chair the hearings. Right. And there's nobody at this eight, nine person table uh, representing right. Medicare for all, single payer. There's every other variety of representative, but nobody right. doing that. Yeah, and uh, the insurance industry, the drug companies, the hospital companies, they all had a seat at the table. And, and one should say also SEIU, the union had a seat at the table, but they didn't advocate it either. They didn't because it was just something that was considered too much pie in the sky. Uh, can never happen in this country. So that, that just indicates how far we've come. And one of the reasons is because we've, we've realized as a nation, and certainly a lot of policymakers have, that the Affordable Care Act, uh, while it did some good, didn't go nearly far enough. We still have nearly 30 million people who don't have insurance in this country and a very rapidly growing number of people who are underinsured. They have insurance, they're paying premiums every month, uh, but they're not able to use their policies in many cases because their deductibles are so high. So we've seen deductibles increase dramatically uh, since the Affordable Care Act was passed. Uh, we've seen that a lot of the practices of the insurance industry have continued. Uh, and one of the consequences uh, of this law is that the entrenched special interests have continued to make a lot of money, a lot of money, but more and more people are in the real world are being disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. As you watched Addie Barkin's testimony, how, how did you feel? You've been fighting this fight for quite a few years. You know, it was somewhat emotional to watch him because his, um, his testimony was incredibly emotional. He is ALS. Uh, uh, he realizes he doesn't have a lot longer to live. And he was talking about his being diagnosed and the, the struggles that he and his family have faced paying for the care that he needs. And they have insurance. They have pretty decent insurance. It was a, 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 a real world example of what people, what can happen to people. We have this, this belief in, in the United States that if you've got employer sponsored health care, if you've got insurance, uh, that it's going to be there when you need it. Uh, but he was uh, living proof with very compelling testimony that that's not the case. Well, what happened to him? I mean, I think most people think once you've paid your deductible, you're covered. But it doesn't necessarily, uh, that's not the way it really is in this, in this country. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that 
Uh, in, in the private health insurance system, uh, you have bureaucrats and an insurance company that really is calling the shots. Uh, it often is, you, your doctor might recommend uh, a treatment or a medication, but there's somewhat an, an insurance company that will be the final decider as to whether or not you get that. And in some cases, the, uh, the decisions are that you're not going to get the coverage. And as he said in his testimony, he wants to stay at home as long as he can to stay with his family. Uh, but he's, to do that, he's essentially had to raise money uh, from supporters to be able to, 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 to pay for the care that, you know, to help. Because uh, he, he would need breathing equipment and other kinds right. of things at home. Yeah, and otherwise he'd have to go into a nursing facility and be away from his, his family. Uh, and so he's having to, to raise money. As he said, it's ridiculous that in this country you have to resort to GoFundMe campaigns to pay for your health care, even if you've got insurance. So that's kind of the state of where we are in this country. A lot of people have insurance. Uh, they, in many cases, have this false belief that it's going to be there when they need it. They don't really understand the role that private insurance companies play, how they have inserted themselves between doctors and, uh, and patients. Uh, and how much they are able to avoid paying for the care that we uh, that we get. Well, we're going to dig into all this in more detail in, in some in our future segments. But talk about uh, what the hearing to a large extent was about the bill pro proposed by Pramila Jayapal. That's right. And uh, what is the gist of her bill, and how would that change things? It would create a Medicare, an improved Medicare for all. Uh, it would expand the, the current Medicare program, which covers people who are 65 and older and people who have certain disabilities. It would expand that to include everybody. Uh, it would also improve it to cover more. Uh, in our current Medicare program, it doesn't cover vision and dental, for example, or long-term care. So that would be covered. And it's also structured to eliminate these deductibles that I just spoke about uh, uh, to make health care more affordable. Uh, we have a system in which a lot of people, as I said, they, they have insurance that they can't use it. They're foregoing the care that they need. They're often not going to the doctor because of the financial obligations they have to, have to make before their insurance kicks in. That would all be ended. Uh, and it would be universal. It would be everybody in the country would be uh, enrolled in Medicare. And it would be ultimately a lot more efficiently operated. We spend about three and a half trillion dollars uh, on health care in this country now, and about a third of that goes to administrative functions and to profits. Uh, much of that could be eliminated. So you, it's, a, it's a very important and very major bill that would restructure how we finance health care. Uh, health care would still be privately delivered. Uh, doctors and, and hospitals will still be private and independent, but uh, be restructuring how we, how we uh, finance care. Now, that's a pretty important question. In Canada, where there is often given as the example of, you know, the kind of system that could be in the United States, uh, most hosp almost all hospitals are publicly owned. Right. And it's one of the ways they control costs. Uh, but in, in, I think in Bernie Sanders' proposal and in uh, Jayapal's proposal, as you said, the hospitals remain what they are. Right. Uh, either they're non private nonprofits right. or private or state owned, but a, a lot of the big hospitals are not publicly owned. That's right. Uh, but isn't that an important feature of making this whole thing affordable? It's an important uh, component of making it workable. Uh, but, like, you know, it's different from the system in the United Kingdom, for example, in which the National Health Service actually owns most of the hospitals and uh, employs most of the doctors. Under the Jayapal bill and the Sanders bill, um, you would have a means of making the health care, certainly at the, let's take hospitals first, for example. Uh, the Jayapal bill would establish global budgets. It would determine uh, a budget for each hospital in the country. and. Uh, uh, based on the patient mix, the demographics of a particular community, what the, what the hospital, what services it offers. Uh, and that would be one way of, of getting uh, our arms around the health care costs in this country. And uh, the same is, is, there would be a similar approach in the Sanders bill. And the, the way we pay for drugs would be changed significantly. Uh, the Medicare program would be able to negotiate directly with drug companies, uh, which it cannot do now. Now, 
one of the significance of this hearing is that it gets heard. Right. But the overall agenda of the House is going to be set by Nancy Pelosi to a large extent. And a lot of the uh, Democrats, some people call corporate Democrats, right. and include Nancy Pelosi in that, uh, are not a fan of Medicare for all. They, they, they want an improved AC, Affordable Health Care Act. Yeah. And, uh, and, and how, how easy is it going to be, or I should say how difficult is it going to be, to really have this heard properly, Medicare for All heard properly on the Hill? Well, it's not going to be a walk in the park for sure. But on the other hand, uh, there are members and other committees that, uh, um, that have signed on as sponsors of this legislation. In fact, it has about 108 co-sponsors, which is a significant percentage of the Democratic caucus in the House. So a lot of uh, members have signed on to this bill. Uh, there are other committees of uh, so-called uh, committees of jurisdiction, like the House Energy and Commerce Committee, the House Ways and Means Committee, the House Budget Committee. They're all expected to hold hearings at some point. Now, the, the one that was just held was in the Rules Committee. So there are a lot of committees that have some jurisdiction over this legislation. There will be others. But that's also uh, uh, historic as well. Uh, we have the, the promise and expectation that at some point these other committees will also hold hearings. So it's being discussed in ways it never has before. And this is going to have a, a, a real effect on the Democratic Party primary. Yeah. I mean, they can't pass this legislation in Congress because the Senate, there's no way the Senate's going to vote for Medicare for all. Right. McConnell said that. He's so, not going to have a, uh, a hearing uh, in the Senate. So the first real practical effect of this is how it might influence the primary because yeah. some of the people running for president, like Bernie Sanders, yeah. are for Medicare for all. I don't think Joe Biden is. I think he's for a stronger ACA. Right. Uh, the, uh, so the hearings are going to have a lot to do with how this debate plays in, the, in a real fight for the leadership uh, to become the representative of the party in the election. Right. And I can't overestimate uh, the importance of today's hearings. And there were some because of Speaker Pelosi's um, uh, ambivalence, I guess you would say, at best toward this legislation, uh, that it would be kind of stacked against those who support Medicare for All, but it actually turned out to be a very good hearing for Medicare for All advocates. I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, they were pretty pretty happy with the way it went. And this is going to be encouraging to advocates around the country uh, that this, first of all, that it was held at all, uh, and secondly, that it got a good hearing. Clearly, there were critics. Uh, the Republicans always get a chance to uh, have uh, those, uh, you know, their friends at the at the witness at the witness table. And they were there. I referred to them as uh, uh, friends of the industry as well, too. Uh, there, was, there was a couple of think tank uh, representatives there, and uh, both of them have gotten money from uh, industry, from corporations. Uh, so they're kind of the usual suspects that uh, you typically see at these hearings. But um, the witnesses invited by the Democrats largely were supportive or made the case for moving forward, mm -hmm. certainly moving beyond where we are now because uh, uh, you, you can't look at where we are and not realize that the Affordable Care Act falls far short of getting us to where we need to be in so many different ways. Okay, in the next segments of uh, our interview, we're going to talk about how Wendell Potter got to be a whistleblower on the industry that he had become a senior executive in. And we will get to the hearings where he blew the whistle on what he knew about as an insider, what he knew about how insurance companies were essentially deciding issues of life, who would live and who would die, and uh, how it brought him to what he called a crisis of conscience to uh, come to Congress and, and expose all of this. And then we'll talk further about uh, the, the issues of the day. So please join us for the continuation of Reality Asserts Itself uh, with Wendell Potter on The Real News Network.